Something about the vibration of the shape of the vibration. Yeah, yeah. 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 Is a tire harder than you? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Definitely a one size fits all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we lost for someone, even though it's a lot taller than I am. Oh. No, that's just like having a lady who was going to be a you don't want us. Dr. Julie Courtright. Dr. Courtright is an associate professor in the Department of History here at Iowa State. She is by training and inclination an environmental historian whose research focuses on the Great Plains of North America. She's writing a trilogy, a trilogy on fire, wind, and water, a trilogy of books to move us beyond the traditional framework, our traditional understanding of the Great Plains as an area of dust, drought, and decline. The first of these three volumes is called Prairie Fire, A Great Plains History, published by the University Press of Kansas. And it's an award-winning volume. It won the Kansas Notable Book Award, and it was a Bancroft Honor Book selection of the Denver Public Library. Dr. Courtright is currently completing her history of wind on the Great Plains, while beginning the research for her history of Great Plains water. She is also, as she will tell you, writing a history and environmental history of dogs, which are indeed her other great obsession. Tonight, drawing on her research for the book on wind, Professor Courtright will introduce us to the 1920s novel and silent movie, both called The Wind, and explain how they connected with the phenomenon of prairie madness. Dr. Courtright. Thank you. 
<laughs> Test. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. No problem. Okay. Let's just. Wendy uh, does bad things to hair. Okay, that's where I was. Um, also blows our trash cans around. Uh, this is another local news station in Wichita, not to be outdone by their competitor. They have a trash can meter, uh, which tells you, <laughs> given the velocity of the wind, where to expect to find your trash can at any given moment. The wind, uh, it, it forces us to learn new words sometimes like derecho, right? Uh, we all know that word uh, now living here at Ames. It creates horrifyingly, terrifyingly bad days where they uh, just make us wait until three o'clock until we know <laughs> whether we're going to be blown away or not. You know, so the wind does a lot of, a lot of things. And as you go to the West, it gets even windier. Um, no, I don't know why my slide looks like that. Uh, it's, the, it's cut off a little bit, but um, funny sign from Wyoming. And then this, a friend sent me this from Wyoming just recently. And you can see that what the wind did to that snow and ice, it literally uh, shapes it. And you can see how windy it has been. So the Great Plains is windy, <laughs> I think is my point. And we have Lots of colorful maps that show us that too, vivid color. And then this one is really interesting. If you if you like weather and the wind like I do, you can go to this website and it's a live picture of what the wind looks like in the United States at any given time. And a lot of times the map looks like this with the Great Plains. Uh, getting the brunt of, of the wind. And they have on quote unquote special weather days, they kind of, they pull some maps out and show you what it looked like during Hurricane Sandy and during various tornadic events and things like that. So it's an interesting website. Now, government agencies also tell us that <laughs> All of this stuff is covering up my part of my PowerPoint. Sorry about that. But uh, the government agencies tell us about uh, the windy nature of the Great Plains as well. Um, in a few years back, NOAA, or the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, put out a list of the 34 windiest cities in the United States. And 21 of the 34 were on the Great Plains. And they span the entire length of the plains. We have Amarillo on the High Plains and Dodge City on the High Plains, but also Wichita in the Tall Grass Prairie and Fargo in on the Northern Plains in the Tall Grass Prairie. And then there are all kinds of others, Cheyenne, Goodland, someplace in New Mexico, I can't remember the name of, Lubbock, you know, all kinds, I won't name them all, but 21 windiest places on the Great Plains, 21 out of 34. So it's definitely the windiest region in the country. Dodge City, Kansas has been named the windiest city um, several times. Number two is first one in Oklahoma and Nebraska. Three, oh, right, Minnesota. And then number three is New Mexico, Ken, North Dakota, only in Colorado, Texas, and Iowa. And the core or peripheral Great Plains state is Mindy, not 
or search terms. More impressively, it doesn't make the uh, top four search terms in any states in the East, any states in the Far West, or in Alaska or Hawaii. So it's the Great Plains that people associate with wind. Um, now, today, uh, I want to talk about wind in the context of a book um, and a movie and an author. Um, and I think one of the points that I'm trying to get across and which I uh, you know, just talked about in the context of the wind being so on people's minds in the Great Plains is that wind is a part of identity on the Great Plains. When I tell people I'm writing a book about wind on the Great Plains, they look at me kind of funny um, and say, well, how do you do that? Um, and <laughs> in fact, when I was first starting out, one of my colleagues, Mike Bailey, was in a meeting with me and he said, well, there's wind everywhere. Why, you know, why the Great Plains? And that got me to thinking and worrying a little bit. But then a couple of weeks later, I ran into an old graduate student from South Dakota, South Dakota native. And I told her I was writing a book about wind on the Great Plains. And she said, oh yeah, yeah, that makes total sense, total sense. Perfect. And she understood immediately the need for that and immediately why Great Plains wind was different. It's not only windier, there are fewer wind breaks. Um, wind is something that's constant on the Great Plains. People live with it and it becomes a part of who they are uh, and part of their part of their identity. So tonight I want to discuss that identity in the con in the historical context of a book, an author, and a movie. Now, the book came out in 1925. The movie came out in 1928. There will be spoilers <laughs> tonight, but you've had 98 years to read the book and you've had 95 years to watch the movie. So no complaining about spoilers. They're just going to be there. All right. Um, so I'll, I'm also gonna talk about Prairie Madness. Prairie Madness is a component of, uh, or it's a, it's a mental illness, a term for mental illness on the Great Plains, and it's connected to environment and it's connected to wind. Now, prairie madness is a mental disorder which may or may not be real. So I'll leave you on the edge of your seat for that one and answer it later, or try to answer it later, in other words, in, in other. Um, now, Emily Dorothy Scarborough. She um, is an author, born January 27th, 1878, died November 7th, 1935. And she wrote a book called The Wind in the 1920s. And uh, the, her novel was a story about what the wind supposedly did to women, specifically. Scarborough is a Texas native born in Mount Carmel, Texas, the youngest of three literary minded children in her family. Her sister published three books after college before marrying. Her brother got a law degree and then became a successful playwright. And uh, Dorothy and her family moved, they, she was born in, in near Tyler, Texas, so East Texas, but then they moved to Sweetwater, Texas in 1882 when Dorothy was five years old and lived in West Texas, hopefully to improve the health of Dorothy's mother. That was the objective for going West into the dry high plains. But 1887, they moved back east to Waco, Texas, so that the children could all go to college at Baylor. Dorothy studied literature. She completed her BA and MA in 1896 and 1899, and did further graduate work at the University of Chicago and Oxford University. Um, she joined the Baylor faculty 1905 to 1915, where she taught writing classes and literature classes. And then 1917, earned her doctorate in literature at Columbia University. They hired her as a lecturer 
and she was promoted to assistant professor in 1923 and associate professor in 1931. And she was the only woman of that rank in the English department at Columbia. Um, now her first novel was In the Land of Cotton. Um, she published a lot about the American South, especially folklore from the South. And in addition to her Southern emphasis, she uh, liked to study the stories of women and supernatural events. And all of those themes are present in The Wind. In total, she published 14 novels, short story collections, poetry, and edited collections. But The Wind is her biggest legacy. Because the book was popular, and it's become more popular um, as it's aged, and because of the movie that was made uh, from the book as well. Uh, she died unexpectedly in November of 1935, age 57 of influenza. So the wind is her legacy. Uh, and <clears throat> it wasn't a big seller at the time. Um, and the movie wasn't a big hit at the time, but both are now considered classics. One of the characteristics of the novel is that it was one of the first novels, first books ever, <laughs> like, but especially fiction books, to ever portray the American West in a negative way. The American West is our identity story as Americans, and <laughs> we tend to mythologize it we tend to make it into a romantic story. And Scarborough comes along and says, no, actually there were some bad things about the West. And that didn't make her any friends, especially not in Texas. And, but now it's sort of a landmark um, event that she uh, actually criticized the West instead of building it up as a part of myth. So Harper, Brothers, uh, Harper and Brothers published the book first anonymously in 1925. They did the anonymous thing as a publicity stunt. So Scarborough's name wasn't on the first edition. It was The Wind by Anonymous. She cooperated with that because she thought it would boost sales. Uh, they had done this with another book and it worked. So they thought, why, why not try it again? And they cultivated a mystery. Who is the author of The Wind? And Scarborough went along with it. Um, because she was very, very focused. She, she was proud of this book. She thought it was her best work so thus far in her career, and she really wanted it to sell well. The Wind by Anonymous hit bookstores in September of 1925. Now, the only, the only place the anonymous publicity stunt really worked was in Texas. Uh, nobody else outside of Texas really cared, um, sadly. Texas was the setting of the novel, Sweetwater was the setting, and it was, of course, Scarborough's home state, although when she was known as anonymous, nobody, nobody knew that for sure. Reviewers complained about the stunt, publicity stunt, but Harper's let the mystery just kind of percolate until after the Christmas shopping season in 1925. And there were ads that ran in newspapers that said things like, who wrote this gripping novel of the Texas Plains in the pioneer 80s? You will be interested in guessing and even more interested in the story. Now, the story was set in the 1880s, and it focused on Letty Mason, a young woman from Virginia who had lost her family, and she was moving to Texas to live with a cousin. Letty was fragile, and she was unfamiliar with the West Texas environment and with West Texas life and culture. Also, in the 1880s, West Texas was going through a serious drought, and because of the constant wind and because of the drought conditions, there was dust flying everywhere, there was sand everywhere. It was um, a bad time <laughs> to get acquainted with West Texas, and Letty comes into this new environment out of Virginia. On the train uh, to Texas, she meets one of the villains of the book. Um, and this villain's name is Wirt Roddy. 
and Wirt Roddy frightened Letty. He told her about the wind. He told her about the impact that the wind had on fragile women such as herself. Um, he told her what it did to uh, women's hair, what it did and what it did to their skin and what it did to their nerves and what it did to their mental well-being. And he scared her. Um, when she gets off the train, she feels the wind for the first time. And Roddy's words really take hold in her head, in her mind, and uh, <laughs> begin to percolate. And the darkness uh, begins to kind of fill in in her mind. And she lets it grow and grow and grow. And it magnifies in her head. And the wind terrorizes her for weeks. She finally marries a cowboy who she does not love uh, because she wants to feel safe and feels like he can anchor her in this, uh, in this new place, scary place. She is tortured by the wind as well as her obsession with Wirt Roddy. She's a little obsessed with him and feels guilty about that. Um, and so that's part of the story too. The wind drives her insane ultimately in the novel. Now, as for the question, who is anonymous? Who wrote the novel? Texans did enjoy guessing. Uh, there were rumors that circulated and there were people debated it. People in literary circles debated it. Uh, the newspapers debated the question. Was anonymous male or female? Everybody had an opinion on that. Um, was anonymous a Texan or an outsider? Everybody really had an opinion on that. Uh, Texans threw out names, Ruth Cross, Vernon Loggins, who were contemporary novelists of Dorothy Scarborough. Even George Scarborough's name was thrown out, who was Dorothy's uh, brother. Dorothy's name uh, was thrown out too as a possibility. So there were all these possibilities circulating. Um, the newspapers got into it. You know, the Corsicana Daily Sun here in December of 1925 talks about how um, that this novel is getting an amazing amount of publicity in Austin. The social gossip column speculates on who the author of who Anonymous is. Is it is it a woman from Austin? Is it Ruth Cross? Ruth Cross seems to be. Uh, the most likely candidate. Her name gets thrown around a lot more than Scarborough's does when they're speculating about who Anonymous is. Ruth Cross taught school in Sweetwater, and so that made her a shoe in according to most people. Everyone who has read the book is trying to place the responsibility for it on someone, uh, the gossip colonists write, and interestingly uses he, you know, uses the male pronoun anyway, wherever he is, he is keeping quiet. Um, so either she thinks it's a he or she just reverts to, to that, uh, that pronoun. So the debate continues. Now, Harper's planned to put out a second edition of The Wind in January of 1926 with Scarborough's name on the cover. Um, but by the end of 1925, the secret... It was still a secret. Most people still didn't know who Anonymous was in Texas, but a few more people did. And by the end of the year, most people seemed to assume that the writer was female. Um, now, before Harper's could release the new edition and reveal Scarborough as the author, um, the book became embroiled in a little controversy, much to the delight of Scarborough and much to the delight of the Harper's publicity department, because this controversy hopefully drove up sales. Um, November 22nd, 1925, the Dallas Morning News published a letter about the wind and its anonymous author. And this letter was written by Royston Crane, a resident of Sweetwater, a lawyer, president of the West Texas Historical Association, and an energetic promoter of West Texas. And he did not like the wind <laughs> or its anonymous author. 
This was an unsolicited editorial. He criticized the wind um, heavily. He assumed the author was female and accused her of outright ignorance, intentional exaggeration and distortion of West Texas culture and environment. Some of Crane's uh, complaints were pretty ridiculous. Most were rooted in Scarborough's depiction of the West Texas environment as hostile, to which he took great offense. He said she invented sand dunes where sand dunes didn't exist. And she implied that rain never fell and that droughts were never broken. And that, of course, was not true. Uh, he said she augmented the force and frequency of the wind. Uh, and he said that the villain in the book, Wirt Roddy, that he was just stringing the newcomer along. And that's what West Texans did. They exaggerated the environment, especially to newcomers. And he found it offensive that uh, Scarborough made a big deal, made him the villain in the book. Crane admitted that the wind and sand could be disagreeable in West Texas, but he said they don't blow all the time and we're a prosperous region. And our uh, anonymous depiction was unnecessary and it might hurt um, the region. Excuse me. He seemed to take this fictional book really personally. Scarborough wrote a response, or I should say anonymous wrote a response, not revealing who she was at the time. Three weeks later, um, her response was printed in the D Dallas Morning News. She ruthlessly takes down Crane's objections. She cites her sources, and she argues that she had relied on her own observations of the Texas environment when writing the book. She poked fun at Crane's ridiculous critiques, and she chided him for getting a character name wrong in his editorial. Um, and she reminded him that the novel was from the point of view of a young female outsider with an irrational obsession, and that this obsession was augmenting the wind in her own mind. So basically saying, Crane, you're taking this too seriously. <laughs> this is fiction. This is, and this is a young girl um, obsessing about something and you need to stop reading it as reality. Reality was not Scarborough's primary objective. But she said, besides, she had seen the win in West Texas and it could do everything that was in the novel, including, including driving a woman mad and including unburying a dead body. There's another spoiler for you. <laughs> the wind unburies a dead body in the book and the movie. And Scarborough said it's perfectly capable of doing that. So why are you, why are you complaining? Um, Crane also had complained that the plot of the wind had never happened in history. And Scarborough said, I'm writing fiction. <laughs> um, so it's not history, it's, it's fiction. Now, some Western Texans acknowledged that the wind didn't really portray them in a perfect light environmentally, the environmental conditions, uh, but you know, it's not booster literature for the region, but, but most people didn't get as upset about it as Crane did. Um, Crane, <laughs> um, obsessed about it and and was frustrated that more people didn't get as impassioned about the topic as he did. Most Texans who commented said, yes, she exaggerated for literary effect, but that was it. Now in Sweetwater, um, there was demand, high demand for the book um, because it was set in Sweetwater and everybody in town wanted to read it. Um, <laughs> there is a rumor that the book was burned on the courthouse steps in Sweetwater. I can't find any confirmation of that. I think it was just a rumor. I think it was a story. Um, but what seems to be more true is that in the Sweetwater Public Library, the um, 
the only copy that they had was chained to the wall um, because they were worried somebody would steal it. Um, and they only had one copy, too much in demand. And so they chained it to the wall. And if you wanted to read it in, in Sweetwater, you had to go in and sit in the library and read it. Um, they did that until a librarian uh, typed up another copy by hand, and then they allowed people to check out the typed copy. Um, I called the Sweetwater R Library because I was curious about whether they still had this copy, and the librarian said, yes, they did. It wasn't chained to the wall anymore, um, but they did have it in a locked case in the Sweetwater Library, so um, I found that out. Okay, uh, so uh, Texans were interested in this. Um, now, in her defense of the novel, Scarborough had said that West Texans had experienced the wind and sand in the book, and they understood prairie madness. So Letty's experience should ring true. But there were critics out there, Crane, and he was the most vocal, and then a few others as well. The anonymous stunt led to speculation that the author was not a native Texan and therefore was unfamiliar with the Texas climate. And that caused a big response in Texas. Um, the idea that an outsider might be writing this was appalling uh, to people like, like Royston Crane. Now, once Scarborough was revealed as the author, then they had to shift gears because she was a native Texan. And so then she got criticized because they said she had grown up, grown to hate West Texas. Obviously, she, she hated Texas because she had lived in Sweetwater as a child, obviously hated it. And this was her uh, kind of <laughs> retribution, re revenge, uh, because she hated Texas so much. This was not true. And Scarborough went to great pains to insist she was a loyal Texan. Uh, in fact, she said, I am a loyal Texan, no less than Mr. Crane. Something must have got on Mr. Crane's nerves. Can it be the wind? And he doesn't know it. Um, so the controversy in the 1920s was all about the depiction of the Texas environment in negative terms. To modern readers, at least to me, that's not what sticks out in the novel. I forgot what my next slide is. Okay, that's it. Uh, um, that's not what sticks out in the novel. What sticks out in the novel to me are gender issues. Uh, the relationship that women had with the wind and with the Texas environment, and also the Great Plains as masculine space. These are the issues that really leap out, um, at least to me <laughs> as a modern reader, uh, you know, it's not the Texas environment stuff, but that's what people in the 1920s were obsessed about. That's all they could see. Also, the gender conversation extends beyond the page to Scarborough as a female author. She was criticized for disloyalty, her credibility as a real Texan questioned. Um, and so the gender issues are layered. I guess, in this, in this, uh, when it comes to this book and the movie, um, as we'll see. But as a reader in 2023, issues of gender just leap off the page. Um, but in the 1920s, they got no attention whatsoever. Now, Scarborough didn't pull her fictional story out of nowhere. Um, wind. And I'm talking about the kind of wind that you all are familiar with, the kind of wind that really annoys you, the wind that knocks at your windows on all those wind advisory days that we get, the wind that you hear on dark nights outside your house, the wind that, that kind of vaguely unsettles you, uh, that makes you feel like something's wrong. Uh, the wind that gives me migraines <laughs> and makes me feel kind of bad. Um, that type of wind, that type of wind specifically, was linked to women for a long time. Um, the wind contributes 
supposedly, uh, to prairie madness in women. At least that's what people say. Now, prairie madness, what is it? Um, it's the idea that the open, isolated, harsh, and windy environment cause women to become mentally ill. It's mostly directed, excuse me, mostly directed at uh, female set American settlers of the, the prairie or the Great Plains in the late 19th century. That's when the idea, the concept of prairie madness really um, is strongest. Um, a woman named Nancy Johnson, who has written about prairie madness, she says, the image of mad pioneer woman has been handed down from generation to generation perpetuating the notion that a large segment of women failed to endure the hardships of the Great Plains settlement experience and or driven insane. Um, now, these authors that perpetuated the idea of prairie madness, Dorothy Scarborough is only one of them. There are a lot. Uh, O.E. Rollbog, who wrote uh, Giants in the Earth, a really famous Great Plains novel. Um, Prairie Madness is in there. Marie Sandos, who wrote Old Jewels, Prairie Madness is in there. Willa Cather, My Antonia, Prairie Madness is in there. Um, so it's in a lot of, of well-known literary works about the Great Plains. Even historians got into it. Walter Prescott Webb, 1931, The Great Plains, um, a landmark book about the region. And in that book, Webb wrote that the wind was peculiarly appalling, had a peculiarly appalling effect on women. The wind alone drove many to the verge of insanity. And so that's a historian, you know, writing that in 1931. This was a well accepted idea. Prairie madness, it's so it's in historical literature, it's in other types of literature, and it's not just old literature. In 2020, a Nebraska poet named Catherine Hirth uh, wrote a poem called Prairie Madness. And it's interesting because she uh, really wanted to highlight the similarities between the old idea of Prairie Madness and the isolation of the pandemic which is an interesting idea. And this is one stanza, you know, I'm standing in the middle of it all, staring out my window at the neighbor jogging past, her hair like mine, the hue of corn silk, weak, a field of grain, our bodies, all of us in rows of loneliness, driven to madness by the prairie wind. Just from 2020. So was prairie madness real? And was it a female malady in the, <laughs> in the parlance of the day? The short answer is no. Prairie madness was not real, but a tiny bit yes. <laughs> and, but not in the way the literature describes it. History is never simple. Um, it's almost never no or yes. It's always more complicated than that. And uh, it is in this case as well, because real mental illness, of course, did happen on the Great Plains. Uh, there was depression. There were people taking to their beds and not being able to get up. There was suicide. There were people who killed their children, you know, inexplicably. Uh, there were people who locked their family members in bedrooms and in attics and in asylums. Uh, there was mental illness. And uh, there was a a social stigma that makes it really hard to research this as a historian because people didn't talk about it. They didn't write it down. Uh, they didn't talk about it in oral histories. They let it be a family secret. And so it's a difficult topic to research. Um, so in that way, yes, Prairie Madness is real. But the idea that mental illnesses were exclusive or nearly exclusive to women is myth. That part of prairie madness is myth.
Now, mental illness was increasing in the United States and in the world in the late 19th century. Um, in 1880, most of the insane were committed to institutions. There were 140 asylums in the United States in 1880. Seven were in the Plains. Um, and using Nebraska as an example, we can see that a very small percentage of the population were labeled insane and were put in these asylums. In Nebraska, 1880 population was 452,000, and 450 people were recorded as insane in that year. Uh, so that's you know less than half a percent, and half of those labeled insane were women. It was almost ex almost split down the <laughs> the middle exactly. Um, so it wasn't an overwhelming majority of people, and it wasn't an overwhelming majority that were women. Um, part of this may be a timing issue. As American settlement of the Great Plains ramped up between the 1870s and the 1890s, the number of insane asylums was increasing in the United States because there was a sense that mental illness was increasing. So likely, it's likely that one of the reasons that prairie madness is linked to the Great Plains is because the growth of asylums happened at the same time as prairie settlement was happening. And building insane asylums was part of this conquest, part of conquest of the Great Plains, part of settlement of the Great Plains. Now, to understand why the idea of prairie madness emerges, we need to consider the societal norms of the day, put it in a little bit of context. Um, as people moved to the Great Plains, both men and women, they took their prevailing attitudes of Victorian society with them. For women, Victorian society promoted ideals like purity, like piety, like domesticity and submissiveness. Um, these were things that women were supposed to be. And it all existed within the framework of a patriarchal society. If women didn't conform to what was expected of them, my clicker is not working. <laughs> the buttons aren't working either. <laughs> I'll let her work on it and I'll continue. Um, if women didn't conform to what was expected of them, they could be judged insane. Uh, even women's biology made them more vulnerable to being, a, being labeled insane. Um, their reproductive systems supposedly made them more nervous, more sensitive, more unstable. Um, men's bodies were considered normal. Thank you. Um, and women's bodies were abnormal. Uh, personality traits that were normal in men could signal insanity in women. Men were aggressive, women were mad. Uh, women who had loose morals or were drawn to vice or who uh, especially uh, were prone to sexual excess, they were clearly insane. You know, this was the feeling of the day, bad behaviors too much interest in politics, depression after childbirth, choosing to stay single. Um, all of these were, were considered potential symptoms of insanity. Causes of men's insanity tended to be things from outside, financial distress, job pressures, the death of a child or a loved one. Uh, the causes of women's insanity, it was more of a minefield and it was more tied to her body. Um, it could come from inside of her body, not from without, as with men. And then there was the Plains environment. There it goes. Um, the Plains environment that they're coming into and they're settling. It's a strange environment. It's open. It's treeless. It's flattish. It's windy. It makes people feel small and lonely. The landscape is overwhelming. It's easy to feel alone. There's nowhere to hide. One of my favorite quotes from Giants in the Earth, the woman who 
goes prairie mad in that book, you know, she, one of the things she says is there's nothing to hide behind. It's a big land, but the openness exposes people, which leads to vulnerability and sometimes instability. Um, also, the landscape is always there. Uh, and today, Johnson notes that cultural change is listed as a major cause of mental disorder. Great Plains men and women experienced great cultural change in an environment that became a constant reminder of that change. They couldn't get away from the place. It was big and open and scary and lonely and intimidating, and it exposed you. Um, not everyone handled that very well. The wind is often singled out as a, an environmental characteristic that contributed to madness. It was constant. It was tiring. It was annoying. You know, you know what it's like. And there weren't as many wind breaks in the 19th century as there are today. A historian has called it an unwelcome intruder into one's mind and thoughts. So in an environment you can't get away from, the wind is perhaps the most intrusive aspect of that environment. Um, early houses sometimes were not tight. Sometimes some of them were made out of tar paper, which just shook when the wind blew, which was always. And it could follow you into the house even. You couldn't always get away from it going in the house. The sound, you heard it constantly. Um, you couldn't get away from it. Sometimes it blew your house away. You know, it was it was that it was that intimidating. Now, asylums did not use did not list the plains environmental conditions as causes for mental illness. Uh, they, they didn't have it on their list of causes, but that didn't stop people from believing it that it was a factor. Um, and it's worth remembering too that the number of people in asylums was low. 450 in Nebraska out of a population of 452,000. But that doesn't include people who had some form of mental illness, but were never diagnosed and were never put in an institution. Um, so there were people out there who, who, of course, were struggling, but hadn't been identified as such. Okay. So was prairie madness real? Uh, yes, in a sense that people in the Great Plains were mentally ill, but no evidence shows that the Plains people were mentally ill more than the rest of the United States at the same time. The real myth is its association with women. People thought that women went insane easier than men, um, but the numbers committed to asylums don't support that, that assumption. Now, some women were tough. In the novel, The Wind, there's a woman named Cora, who is the wife of Letty's cousin, and she's who, they're, who she's staying with. And Cora is tough. She's a plains woman. She withstands drought. She withstands the sand and the heat and the wind. And it, and it doesn't get to her like it gets to Letty. But Letty was an outsider, and she's not a hardened plains woman. Now, as I said, The Wind as a novel was not a big seller in the United States. It sold well in Texas, and that was about it. But a very famous person got a hold of the book and loved it. Silent film actress Lillian Gish. She described the book as pure motion, and she loved it. And she wanted to put it on film. So she used her star power to get um, MGM, to buy the rights so that she could star as Letty. And uh, Victor Seastrom, a Swedish director, was hired. Lars Hansen, another Swede, was hired as uh, cast as Letty's husband. And the filming began in 1927. The movie debuted in 1928, but like the book, it had a less than auspicious opening. So it was one of the last silent films, um, and is, but is considered a classic today particularly in cinematography. Gish met with Dorothy Scarborough and the two asked uh, Texans to send in photos of the landscape and of the wind so that they could put it into action. Um, recreating the wind in the movie was pretty intense. Gish called it one of my worst experiences in filmmaking. It was filmed in the Mojave Desert, temperatures soared, the technicians had to pack 
the film in ice so that it didn't melt before it was uh, uh, developed. The way that Seastrom created the wind was with nine airplane propellers. Um, and then he added sulfur pots to augment the, the look of the sandstorms. So you had the glamorous Lillian Gish standing in front of a shack in a shabby dress while mechanic, mechanized wind threw sand at her. And the crew, uh, the crew wore goggles and they had grease on their face to prevent the, them from sunburning and they had boots uh, to protect from the rattlesnake bites. Uh, but Gish and the other actors didn't get to wear any of that um, except while they were on breaks. And so uh, she said that she worried uh, most about her eyesight uh, because of the sand flying in her eyes. Um, she did wear the goggles part of the time because they're on breaks because there is a photo of her. Um, but her job, according to the New York Times, on the day that the New York Times visited the set was to pile sand over the body of the man she had killed with all nine wind machines going all the time like nine mechanical devils. In the novel, Letty internalized an external enemy, and this happened in the movie as well. As in Scarborough's novel, the wind is an anthropomorphic enabler to prairie madness. It, she internalizes it, and it drives her insane. The New York Times reporter really described it well. He said, it's the wind howling, whistling, shrieking, yelling, and caterwauling with never a pause for breath. The wind slamming doors shut and banging them open. The wind clawing with sandy fingers, not only at the physical, but also at the psychical entity of the heroine, which drives her with awful and unescapable persistence from one unstable act to the other, up to and including murder. The end of the wind still elicits controversy. Uh, Scarborough's conclusion is bleak, but appropriate given the gendered uh, tone of the story. Throughout the book, Letty has been edging toward madness. And in the last few pages, she finally gets there. Um, Letty and Liege, her husband, argue, and he leaves the homestead. Then her secret obsession, Wirt Roddy, shows up. He's a man that both attracts and repels her and who first introduced her, introduced her to the wind, and he appears at her door. In a panic from the wind and her own madness, Letty flings herself into his arms. They have consensual sex. The next morning, after the wind has stopped, a clear-headed Letty laments uh, that an act of delirium would ruin her life. Uh, she hadn't been herself. It was the wind that was to blame. She had been mad, in other words. Roddy insists that they go away together because her husband will kill them both. But Letty refuses. They argue. She grabs a gun and she kills him. She's horrified. And Letty goes and buries the body in the sand drifts that the wind has piled along the fence. So interestingly, the wind drove her to cheat and kill and now, ironically, she thinks it's going to hide her sins. Um, so there's something there that I need to analyze a little more. But um, Letty is momentarily comforted, but then the wind picks up from another direction and it starts to unbury the body. Methodically and with malice in Letty's mind, um, the wind is exposing her uh, crimes. It's mocking her as it reveals her sins to her husband, who she expects to come home at any minute. She's powerless in the face of the evil that swirls around her, and Letty stops fighting. Laughing and screaming madly, she flees across the prairies like a leaf blown in a gale, borne along in the force of the wind that was at last to have its way with her. Now, that <laughs> that language have its way with her. In, the, in that language, the wind rapes her, right? It dominates her. Um, the wind exposes Letty's sexual infidelity and exposes her madness to the world, and it rapes her, in, at least in Scarborough's language. 
No man comes to save her, nor is she able to save herself. So it's pretty bleak, way too bleak for Hollywood. <laughs> so they tacked a happy ending on. Uh, they made it a lot happier. Wirt Roddy arrives, he forces his way in. Um, they have sex. I can't tell if it's rape or not. I go back and forth. It's so subtle in this 1920s film. Uh, today, I don't think it's rape. <laughs> Ask me tomorrow and I'm not sure. It's, it's so subtle. Um, but anyway, the next morning, uh, he insists they go away. She kills him. She buries the body. The wind uncovers it. Um, but here's where it differs. The movie differs from the book. Suddenly, two hands appear at the door, forcing it open. Letty thinks that it's Wirt Roddy come back to life and coming in to get her. But it's her husband, Leash. Uh, she confesses that she killed and buried Roddy. Uh, but when Liege goes to look out the window, the body is gone. So it was all in Letty's mind. In other words, uh, she was mad. Relieved that Liege is there, <laughs> she suddenly and inexplicably decides that, oh, she's loved him all along. Um, she's in love with him, and she no longer wants to leave Texas, and she's no longer afraid of the wind that's terrorized her for months. So it's an ending that doesn't make any sense in the context of the rest of the story, but it's a Hollywood happy ending, and uh, she now feels safe and is no longer afraid. Uh, so in the end of the movie, at least, a man saves Letty and makes everything okay. Uh, the wind was mostly in her mind, as was the murder, and her husband who represents, of course, domesticity and the promise of a home life, he makes all the madness go away. Um, so Letty has to acquiesce to one thing in order to find peace with the other. Uh, and she finds peace with the wind through traditional, uh, the way that women are supposed to be <laughs> uh, and behaving normally, quote unquote, normally for, for women. Um, so the wind is novel and movie. They're fascinating from, whoops, <laughs> what happened there? I'm sorry. <laughs> Technical problems. Um, she'll come fix it. In the novel, uh, <clears throat> like I said, gender dynamics leap off the page. Page four, how could a frail, sensitive woman fight the wind? It's called to her like a demon lover. I mean, that's pretty, pretty obvious stuff. But statements like this got no attention uh, in the 1920s at all. And remember, it was not only Letty who had problems with the wind. Dorothy Scarborough did too. She was an accomplished, educated woman in a male-dominated profession. Born in the 19th century, she accepted prairie madness as truth. Letty's bad behavior, which is her longing for Wirt Roddy, um, led her down the path to insanity. But Scarborough was also a victim to her own time's biases. It was after Anonymous's gender was well accepted that Mr. Crane's diatribe against her book went public. And she was criticized publicly for being a fraud, being an ignorant author, being a disloyal Texan. So it wasn't just Letty. Dorothy Scarborough also had her issues, uh, gender issues in this whole um, drama as well. At least one minister in Waco preached a sermon about her book. <laughs> I can't find the text of the sermon, unfortunately. Um, now, because she wrote a fictional story about the harsh Texas wind and, and struggle, Dorothy Scarborough gets, gets you know, criticized uh, heavily. Would a male author have received those criticisms? Who knows? Who knows? Um, but it's clear that Dorothy Scarborough's relationship with the wind is heavily gendered. It's also tied to identity and memory. Um, some West Texans resented Scarborough's negative portrayal of the state. Others didn't see anything wrong with it. Um, but because wind was a, was a part of Texas identity and helped define the region, um, yes, wind is present here, but should its obnoxious, obnoxiousness be put on public display? That subject was more controversial. 
Part of the disagreement can be explained by studying memory and myth in the context of the American West. The myth tells us that the West is a place of hardship, but more importantly, the West is triumph over hardship. The West is a place where fragile women go mad, but strong or masculine uh, people conquer the West um, and succeed. Scarborough wrote a story about the West that did not conform to the mythical happy ending that the myth required. The end of the movie did that, but that wasn't Scarborough's doing. So um, her relationship with wind really centers around these characteristics. In my book, uh, tentatively titled Windswept, I am looking at different individuals and their relationship with wind. Scarborough is an example. This man, William DeLoach, was a farmer in West Texas. Um, his relationship with wind centered around agriculture and uh, economy and his work as a farmer. He worked in the wind and it affected him uh, profoundly. Francis Warren is another example. He was a politician in 19th century Wyoming and coping with the wind was part of his transition from an outsider to an insider um, within Wyoming society and, and environment and uh, politics. He eventually becomes uh, Wyoming's first governor. And Snowden Flora, um, who was a meteorologist in early 20th century Kansas. His relationship with wind is centered on crisis wind, primarily tornadoes. Uh, he was obsessed with tornadoes. He studied them as part of his profession. He studied them in his downtime. He collected photographs of tornadoes, had the biggest collection of tornado photographs in the world. Uh, and he wrote a book about it in his retirement. Uh, he loved tornadoes. And he was profoundly sad that he never got to see one. Um, but these every person you know that uh, I've identified several people that have each has a very different relationship with wind. And I think each of them can can teach us something about how wind uh, affected people in history, and by extension, of course, how wind still affects us today. Now that's the end of my talk, uh, and I'm over a little. I'm over a little bit. Sorry about that. Um, but I will put uh, the last. Hopefully, if the technology works, I'll put the last 15 minutes of the wind movie on the screen as you're as you're chatting and leaving. If you're interested, you can take a look at what that movie um, looks like. Um, and if we have any time left, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Julie. Are there any questions in the audience? We're using a mic so our at home audience can follow along. Yes. Change in farming uh, practices has affected the wind. I know from my own history, our farm had a lot more wind breaks mm -hmm. when I was growing up than mm -hmm. now. Than now? Yeah, and you can see that as you travel, you know, the acres and acres and acres of corn with no wind mm -hmm. breaks. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I, I wasn't clear that the number of wind breaks had, had declined intentionally. Yeah. Um, but I think it makes sense now that you say it because I think, uh, you know, there's a reliance on technology and also a reliance on increased knowledge of how to plow um, so that, you, that farmers know more about how to work the land so that the wind doesn't, wind erosion isn't as much of a factor. So then they can, they think maybe they can rely less on wind breaks because those wind breaks, of course, take up valuable acreage. Um, but they're pretty, they seem pretty important, <laughs> at least in, in historical times, they seem pretty important. Um, and I was not aware that they were less important today, but that's interesting. Yes, sir. Um, my, name, my name is Dick Ross, and I my question is, uh, 
that there are winds, names for winds in other parts of the world. For example, uh, I lived in Hanover, Germany. Mm -hmm. Fon, uh -huh. winds that come off of the North Sea. Uh -huh. It's a, psycho a uh -huh. sort of a psychological imp uh, effect there, I think. But I wonder if there is a literature, not either novels or mm -hmm. any other kind of literature mm -hmm. surrounding that. Uh, another one would be the Chinooks that come. Yeah, and I was just going to bring that up. The Santa Ana's in uh -huh. uh, California. Yeah. Oh, or is there, is there a, a literature that kind of tracks that kind of thing and the, the psyche of the people? Um, the yeah, I don't know about the psyche of the people. I know I have read um, articles about named winds. Uh, there's one in France. Oh, where's John Monroe when I need him? He told me, <laughs> but uh, there's one in France uh, with, that is a named wind. And then, of course, uh, in the United States, in the Great Plains is the Chinooks. Um, but I, the psychology behind that, um, I haven't run across anything like that, but, uh, I would think it would be out there it's, it's a great topic if it's not, if nobody's covered it yet. Mm. Julie, it's, it's so nice. Wonderful talk. So exciting. Now I've got to read a book. Yeah, and as a southern, as a southerner, mm -hmm. uh, I got another book about wind that is, okay. you know, and a woman who's having trouble keeping it under control, uh, and um, and it did probably a little bit better in 1939 than this magnificent film, but I think it did, but, <laughs> um, but just a little, but uh, but that was a problem of sound, and, and Lillian Gish looks great, and all the rest mm -hmm. of it. The question I've got is. The wind doesn't really show up. The wind is the war and gone with the wind. Mm -hmm. But the wind here, you say, is in her mind. But shows from here, mm -hmm. he, the, the cyclone shows up right after if you see her in a move in a, in a mirror. And mm -hmm. the wind, I'm going to say, you're right. It's in her. It's in her. But it's maybe a little bit lower down than in her head. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And yeah. There's a lot of sex in here, isn't there? And but mm -hmm. I don't know that it's such um, that it's such a Hollywood ending because I mean the director is he's a symbolist and he he thinks the wind is not the wind. Uh -huh. And the woman who writes the writes the screenplay, Frances Marion, yeah, has a uh, you know she's more she's a little complicated. So I'm wondering. So you don't think it's really a happy ending? I was wondering what. Um, what frontier thesis how you would link this into the to the oh lord thesis. larry <laughs> but, but I, the first time i saw this the first title card i thought that's the frontier thesis but um i have not thought of it in that context um let me just say if our department could show this film or if the ames public library could show this film i uh, think it would be a service to the community <laughs> uh, and, uh, the wind and the frontier thesis. Okay, I'm going to think about that. Thank you. <laughs> I can't answer it right now. Julie, how did Dorothy Scarborough react to the movie version of her novel? She seems to be have been okay with it. Pretty, pretty okay with it. I think Lillian Gish was more upset than Scarborough was. Um, Gish insisted in her old age that they filmed the, the real ending um, and that MGM forced them to use the happy ending. Um, and others say there's absolutely no evidence that nobody else re remembers filming a different ending. Um, and they say that Gish invented the memory um, or, or she was just making things up. Um, but she was clearly unhappy with it. She, she wrote a letter to Scarborough about the ending and kind of apologized for it. And Scarborough comes back and basically says, well, I just want people to watch it. I just want people to uh, 
watch the story and be happy with it. And she basically said, I'm okay with it. Um, but Gish talked about it in her autobiography. She talked about it in interviews throughout her life. She would, it would, she would mention it once, uh, once in a while. She did not like the ending at all. Um, I'm surprised that Scarborough didn't have a bigger problem with it. If she did, she didn't write about it. Uh, she didn't write about it much. Yes. Um, you didn't mention isolation mm -hmm. as a contributing factor mm -hmm. to uh, the wind Madness. issue. I yeah. just got back from a road trip to West Kansas. <laughs> uh -huh. There's yeah. Not a lot out there. <laughs> so. Yes, isolation is a big, big part of it. Uh, yeah, I think I only mentioned it in really quick passing, but um, it is true. People were lonely and women were lonely in particular uh, because men, men went out and did business, you know, they went out and worked and interacted and with each other and Women did that too a little bit, but not as much. And they were more tied to the house. And uh, if your neighbor was a long ways away, yeah, it's pretty overly dramatic. And if your neighbor was a long ways away, then that isolation was very real. Um, and if you had were used to, you know, if you were a new settler onto the plains and you were used to socializing more uh, back in the East where you came from, that could be a that could be a, a big challenge. And so, you know, I don't think it's wrong that the environment was mentally challenging for people. I, I think it was right. I think it's absolutely true. Um, because how could it not be? <laughs> it, it was, it's a challenging environment, but where Prairie Madness goes wrong is this uh, exclusivity, exclusivity with women, um, because the numbers do show that men, uh, also struggled with mental illness and, um, but isolation was an absolutely a big part of that. The horses are a, uh, a symbol in the movie. They're kind of this part of the supernatural aspect of the film. <laughs> I think he's going to come do that in a minute. Uh, any other questions? This movie is difficult to find online in its full form with its real soundtrack. I found it with a, somebody else has replaced the sound for the original soundtrack with their own, which I don't think is a good idea. Um, but it, it's sort of challenging to find it streaming anywhere. They do have some copies on eBay on DVD for sale. <laughs> well, thank you, Julie. Thank you.